Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, it's really nice to be invited here. And um, listening to the last discussion is very interesting because I have just done two years as being president of the RIBA. And I'm a, an architect in practice myself, so I can relate totally to what you're saying. But there's also Ireland. I come from Ireland. I'm Irish. I'm part of the Irish institution, and they're more your size. We have 3,000 architects in Ireland. They publish their own magazine, and there's another magazine, which is, which is Plan Magazine, more of the, the, the building side of architecture, as opposed to the actual um, institution side. But I think, I think you're missing a trick. I think it's very important that you have some kind of publication that is critical, that you need to be campaigners. If you want to change your countryside, it's not going to change by itself. You architects are the people that have the voice, the knowledge, the talent. You architects should be out there campaigning. You should be up there with your placards saying, we don't, we do, we don't stand for this. You should be there saying, we have a solution. And that solution will be all of your brains put together. It's you. You caused the problem by not standing up. OK, so I'm a campaigner. I stand up for lots of things. I'm going to show you a few things today, and I'm going to finish up with a little four-minute film. And that film was the result of a campaign. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that as I go. Um, can most of you understand? I see hardly anyone. You can mostly understand what I'm saying. If I speak too quickly, just go like this, okay? <laughs> the power of social media, the power of media, radio, television. That is how architects can get across a really good message on the value of architecture and what architecture and good design can do for the public. Have I got a little button? Ah. Thank you. Is that easy to do? It's back and forth. Twitter. You should all be on Twitter. Twitter is a very good way of getting your message across to thousands of people, and then it gets retweeted. If you do a little um, an article, or if you do a program, or have a very good photograph, whatever it is, you can just put it up, and it goes viral. It goes all around, not just in the UK, but to other countries. And I think that for Croatians, it's very important for you to get your message out because we don't really hear about Croatian architects. I know one Croatian architect, and her name is Zoka Zola. And I met her during a, um, during a, a campaign um, 20 years ago. And she's a fantastic architect. But we need to know more about more of you fantastic architects. So publication, online, social media, and you need a program on your television dedicated to architecture or something that's going to let the public know what you do, why they should be using you and not trying to build themselves, and, and the value of what we bring to society. Okay, so we've got 40,000 members in the RIBA. You know, that's quite a lot of members. 6,000 of those are overseas. So when I came to the RIBA as an outsider, I mean, I've been living in London for 20, 28 years, um, but when I came to the RIBA, I was totally against the institution. They were doing nothing for us. And I said, why can't we do this or this? You do nothing for women. You do nothing for diversity. So it's only when people that are architects stand up for what they believe in, they have a voice, and you can, you can get more people out there to get that message across. So basically, we're 40,000 people. We promote architecture and the value of architecture. Um, there are 500 people that work for the RIBA. You know, 250 in London and the other 200, and the other 300, and 14 branches. Um, one of the things that I stood for, um, you know, eight years ago, was women in architecture and diversity. In the last three years, I've stood up for internationalizing the RIBA, um, promoting diversity and equality. Um, procurement reform, and that's what we were talking about yesterday. Procurement, how we all get jobs. Because at the moment, with EU procurement, you've got to be very careful of. You need to stand up with other partners and say, we need to do this, this, and this, not just what you're given. Um, procurement reform is essential, and we wrote a very good 
um, article following research called Ladders of Opportunity. And this publication was also online. We had 52 people from the professions, other professions, around a table for a year you know, regular meetings to say how we need to change procurement because the government do not understand. EU do not understand. And unless you actually stand up and say, hey, we can do it better, that's the way to go forward. So RIBA, you know, I'm obviously a fan of the RIBA. Um, I wouldn't have done my two years as president with no pay um, if I didn't believe in them. Research is essential. So research, um, Dickon Robinson spoke to you yesterday, um, or the day before yesterday, um, on the future of architects, and that will apply quite likely to you guys too. Architecture isn't understood by the public, and people don't understand what we do. We need to get out there, not just talk to ourselves, I know we're talking to ourselves now, but there sh shouldn't be just architects in this room. We should have politicians right there on that front row, politicians listening to you guys to make changes that you need to make this country better. <laughs> now, there's a good chance they were invited, and they probably didn't come. Oh, there was a first one. Good, okay. If they don't turn up, don't vote them in, and vote the ones in that will turn up. So, we find out what is the future of architects. It was a very serious and long report. And it, was, um, it wasn't saying, hey, everything is rosy and fine. It was saying, we have got serious problems. We're talking to each other too much and not out there. We're not engaging with our politicians. So a very good report. I won't go into detail because Dickon spoke about that. The current government is conservative. Now, whilst I am apolitical, I'm certainly not conservative. Conservative government with the coalition have put up fees for architecture, all students, including architecture students, from £3,000 a year to £9,000 a year. That is scandalous. That is absolutely scandalous. The cost of an architectural education, including your accommodation and materials, is £88,000. What is that going to do for diversity of our profession? It will go back to being an elitist, rich kids, rich kids profession, and that is not the way architecture should be. So huge campaigns against fees. The fees are still the same, but the fees, the fees will be a voting point for the next government. We publish a lot of articles at the RIBA, as was referred to earlier. The HomeWise is a campaign, because throughout the UK, We've, we have had a series of um, very poor quality housing built by large developers. Um, it's the same in many countries. But the problem is that these, these small houses were inadequate in many ways. So we said we'd have a three-year campaign constantly talking to politicians, but we're asking the public, what do they think about the houses that they are living in? What do they think? Are they happy with what they've been given? 80% of the houses built around Britain in larger states are not designed by architects. They're pattern book architects. So they're cheap and cheerful and they make money for the, um, the, con the developer. Um, we've got a lot of champions like Alain de Botton. So one of the great but often unmentioned causes of both happiness and misery is the quality of our environment and the kind of walls, chairs, buildings and streets we're surrounded by. And that's the same. We've got to say value, value this, value good design. Try and just make things better for people. So without um, light and space, light as in natural daylight and space to store your, equipment, your, your stuff at home, these are the two major things that, that were found to be lacking. So as part of our campaign, we went out all over the country. We had a website. But when we went around the country, talking to people, asking for feedback in the newspapers, in the Guardian, in the Telegraph, all the, the five major newspapers, asking people to give us feedback. So we're engaging with the wider population, grassroots level up. So from the ground to the top, which would be the top politicians. And these, these are the three things. I won't read them out. But it's about light and space. 
And the way we live now is the actual name of one of the reports that we published. So three clear goals. We need to make the government set new space standards, and that's under consideration right now, to say that actually being 10% smaller than the rest of Europe is not good enough for new housing. We want to have at least the same, if not better, back to what we had in the 1950s when the first space standards came in, the Parker Morris, to which all social housing was built. Private housing was 10% smaller than the basic of social housing. And they were allowed to get away with it because there was a shortage of housing. And people would buy what was there because there was nothing else available. And the developers say, they love our houses. Well, they don't. Some of our publications here, so um, building the homes and communities Britain needs, the case for space, and then a series of videos that we went, and we actually watched over 24 hours, seven different families, how they actually live and use their space. And it was incredible, the difficulty people, particularly with small children, when there's just no space, there's not enough light. And then if you think about the health and well-being, unless you actually have good light and good space, you can have mental health problems or you can have physical problems. And these things need to be taken into account. So one way to tackle the government on this is to say, current housing is actually making people ill. And look at your NHS, your National Housing Bill. So this is one way to say, if you had better housing, people would be healthier. So there's a big move right now, here and in the States and in other parts of Europe, for healthier, healthier lifestyles, healthier well-being. And one of the simple things like that is um, the, the um, cycling, for example. Cycling now in London, everybody seems to have a bicycle. I mean, I don't have a car. And when I say that, when I give talks in China and I say to people, I don't have a car, they say, God, she doesn't have a car. You know, as if, as if, you know, that must be awful. But I say it's great. If you have good public transport and a bicycle and a pair of legs, you're away. You don't need, you don't need to have a car. One of my earlier campaigns was Women in Architecture um, with a group called Architects for Change. You might consider your own Architects for Change. Architects for Change wanted to change the face of architecture, the face of architecture. We were only 12, we were, then we were 6% women. We're only 12% women, and then in practice, we are 18% women. 50-50 in college, but only 20% in practice now. So we were trying to up the profile, and the only way to up your profile is go out there and say, hey, we're actually quite good. We have Survival and Success, which is a seminar to try and help people mentor other, other young architects. And that was a really good cross-professional um, mentoring scheme launched two years ago. But the very, the very fact that you are helping younger people come up and say, you know, it's not that difficult, really, if you do this, this, and this, and you give them encouragement and advice, because too many people drop out. Um, I'll come on to the reasons for that in a minute. But I was so delighted to hear that you are about 70% women here. Hey, that's really good. 70%, that is incredible. In the Middle East, it's 70%. And I was surprised at that statistic too. We need to promote, and that goes for whether we're architects or women in architects or black and ethnic minority architects. If you are the underdog or if you are somebody who doesn't get heard, or if you want to make a, po a point, you've got to get out there. Don't just network with architects, network with the rest of your profession and the people who are likely to give you those jobs. So we said, let's get the best of women and black and ethnic minority architects, because they were 6%, we were 10% at the time. And we had a modest exhibition. I say modest, it was, it was quite a good exhibition. But it was 50 people with one panel and it said, what does diversity mean to you? Show us three of your projects and show us three of maybe the problems that you have and how you might go about them. So it's not moaning. It's not going, oh, it's dreadful, isn't it? It's saying, hey, this is great. We do really good work. Here is what we do. And that exhibition, that modest exhibition, got called to 24 cities around the world. And in every exhibition that we went to, we said, give us your 10 or 20, or in China, give us 30 of your best. And then we called it the Global Snowball because it went all around. It actually went to 34 venues, including Britain. 
But, and there's Zoka Zola in the white trousers there. Zoka Zola, my, my Croatian architect who works in um, Chicago. She was part of our team. And George Ferguson, the then president in the red pants there. But we went all over. And this was just giving other people support. And everywhere we went, it was almost the same story. You need to do research in order to be able to make your point. And we heard research here today, the research about your magazine. It sounds like a very big magazine with no advertising. I would just change that. Smaller magazine, lots of advertising. And if you choose your advertisers well, there's no conflict of interest. But don't have your hands tied. You know, if you want to publish, publish. And just get around the problems of it, you know. Times are changing. But you need to have the research to back up your argument. If we said, you know, there's not enough women or there's not enough ethnic minorities or if there's, if there's not enough small practices, um, you know, 80% of the 40,000 architects, 80% are under 10 people in their practices. So it's called micro. It's not a great name. It sounds minuscule. It's badly interpreted in the EU. It's called SME. SME is under 250. So we've had to change numerous rules to get SME meaning micro when you're talking about architecture because they've got such a broad brush for everything. So you need to be very careful on certain things like that. But so you need to promote. So we said, well, why do women live ar leave architecture? University of Western England published this wonderful report. It's on the website. Just put in go into Google, why do women leave architecture? And this will pop up. And, you know, there's lots of reasons. Macho culture. There's too much, too much dominance of, you know, in any of these big practices, Foster's or Zahadid or um, Grimshaw's. It's not them that's doing all of the work. It's the team. They should have much more of the, you know, it's now ZHA, Zahadid Architects Office. I mean, it's, 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 um, it's a little bit more open to credit for the others. But I think very often it's the Starkey tech system that holds us back. And I think it's much more architects as individuals and groups, what we can do for society. Um, government legislation is changing because the biggest holdback for women, um, generally in Europe, is as soon as you have a baby, average age of 34 for women architects, um, you take time off because we are the lowest paid profession. It's hard to um, have uh, childcare because it costs the same as your salary, practically. And then women often lose confidence in getting back, or they have another baby, and whatever it is, and there's not enough sharing. I've been very lucky. I've had a totally equal partner in, when it comes to child rearing or child minding or cooking or whatever it is. And more people are becoming, it used to be called the new man about 10 years ago. But um, I think here you don't have that problem. But certainly, um, by 2015, Men can now take a year off. So when women go for that job, they won't be discriminated as much as, hmm, you're 32, you're probably going to have a baby in two years. Um, so that will probably help a little bit. Um, but supporting each other by networks and doing European networks. This is Austria, the Zimt Group. So we've been a catalyst for change for five or seven other women in architecture groups to get out there and promote themselves. Um, I've been all over the world in the last uh, three years, um, coming up to being president and as president. And internationalizing the RIA, RIBA was a very big thing for me because you can be too insular. Partly also because I'm Irish and I've traveled to many places. I've worked in Canada and in, in Copenhagen and I'm in London the last 28 years. So um, getting out there and telling people what it's like, comparing, but most important, how can you share ideas? How can you make things better for each other? And I think that that, that is a really good thing. Um, this is one of my passions, and I know um, it was great to, uh, to speak to our, our Danish speaker yesterday, um, because uh, Bofield Escaba is co-housing. And when I left college, um, left Dublin, when I, when I graduated, I won a scholarship to go to Copenhagen for a year and a half and I saw this fantastic type of co-housing. I said, hey, that's fantastic. I don't want to tell you all about Irish housing. I want to learn about your Danish housing. So I changed my course and I went to visit 34 of the, of the co-housing projects because I thought that was just such a great way to live. 
and then you bring back some of this knowledge, and this is one of our schemes. And the idea is, how can you break down the barriers of the, um, the English man's house is his castle, has a barrier, doesn't share anything, doesn't share any front gardens or anything like that. And then how do you get across that when you're trying to take ideas um, or use ideas in a different way, how do you disseminate that? Well, we have open house, and I would love to see open house. I know you have a type of open house here. But open houses where many housing schemes are opened up, thousands of them, every year in September, and the public are invited in, and they learn about the housing scheme, the design, they get in and walk around the houses. Sometimes you can get a new job out of it. So it's a very good thing to actually be showing off your projects and just showing the different houses and mix. In this particular scheme, it was all open courtyard, so it was more of a Scandinavian uh, way of living or Dutch model with different types of housing. And this is where we have social housing. So you have 25% of these homes will pay 150 pounds a week, living beside somebody who paid one and a half million pounds for their house. And this is where you have the diversity of people mixed together. They don't have an option. This, is, this was the, mayor, the mayor's solution for 25% social housing. Then it went up to 50% on some sites. And then of course, the new mayor is quite different. Boris Johnson doesn't have the same social, he's conservative, so he just to say doesn't have the same social ethos that our previous mayor had. But there's been an awful lot of good mixed social housing. And one of the things on the ground that we were talking about as a, as a theme, in Phoenix House is the other project I'm just going to quickly show you. It's the, it's the biodiversity, it's the free freedom of movement of people, and it's bringing the openness of sites so that you can travel through a site and it's not gated like so many of the 1970s and 80s projects were built in London. And it's to have that, so biodiversity, um, thinking about the animals and insects and birds, football pitch on the fifth floor, and having all of the ground floor for people. So simple things for a mixed tenure again. This was 50% um, social housing, 25% uh, key worker and 25% private. Um, in an open, open courtyard, open aspect, where you know you're, you're right down beside existing two-story, and you step, step right up. Everybody has space and light. Everybody has some greenery, a small front garden opening into shared gardens, hard landscaping, and soft landscaping. And it's these simple, simple ways of of getting people to meet, enabling people to meet in an easy and friendly way, which is, which is sometimes lacking in a lot of the London inner city projects. Um, and growing your own, growing your own vegetables is very important and a very good way of communicating with people. And communicating with people and then showing your schemes off to the public saying, we should have more of the open type of architecture. The St. Catherine's Foyer is a project we did in Dublin where you can bring a good idea to a government and try and make it happen. Um, during the early boomtown years in Dublin, um, 10 years ago, we went to the Irish government and said, 18 to 25 year olds are not getting, um, you know, there's drugs problem, they're homeless, they're in the streets, um, or they're being ignored by society. And many of them are hidden homeless. Now from France came the idea of the Foyer des Jeunes, which is a home, home, for, the, home for the young. And that then came to Britain via a competition and I think competitions are another thing. I, I, you must probably do lots of competitions. But just the Foyer des Jeunes was a way of introducing a new home for kids and giving them an opportunity for a stepping stone to independent living. So this was kind of like the social heart of the city centre of Dublin. It was the first building in the new regeneration area, the digital hub. So people learnt basic skills on how to cook, how to look after themselves, went on a training course whether it was learning how to build a brick wall or whether it was IT, information technology, cooking skills, they can cook and then they can do catering or sporting skills. Lots of different things. Bright, colorful, robust, a real place for kids. Um, moving on again now, um, when I'm talking about kids and, and young people, is in order for them to understand the built environment and understand what we do, we need to tell them about the big problems out there, which is trying to reduce our carbon footprint. And that's where we as architects can bring that message. We can deliver a message that's, you know, European legislation. You're all going to have to work to the new rules for cutting carbon. Um, you're already probably d using those rules, but there's new more stringent rules coming in. 
I think one of the big problems with trying to cut our carbon is that big business rules from America to Europe to UK and with conservative government, big business doesn't like green and doesn't like eco-friendly. So we as architects have to push our message stronger. We've got a new government policy actually being written by Terry Farrell, which will hopefully help get the agenda. But going into schools, going into galleries, I've been doing this for 15 years, and it's teaching kids about eco-design, teaching them about um, how they can actually design like architects. It's, it's great fun, and I, I really do ask people, adopt a school. You pick up the phone to the headmaster or the headmistress and say, can I come in and talk to your kids for a couple of hours? Can I run a workshop? And these kids are the future architects or engineers or clients or politicians, and they'll remember that you went in there and ran a project. They'll remember that. So I think you've got to get the hearts and minds of the young, of the, things, of the kids that are seven to 10, or the 18 and 20 year olds, uh, sorry, the 16 year olds who are choosing a career. And if you can go in and inspire them into being an architect, I think, or an engineer, it's a great thing. Um, the power of media I spoke about I don't know how I'm doing for time. Oh gosh, I'm running a bit late. Um, the power of media. Um, I think that we need to get our message across to the public. And I was given an opportunity to work alongside um, a primetime television show on Channel 4. It's still going out four years later on More 4. It's, it's still going out like this week. Um, but the idea was I got to go to, I picked six cities and I would go to those cities for two days. I would pick out the very best house, and then I would, uh, the very best house, like in Venice, I would go on the Grand Canale to the Gazia home, the, who make the coffee machines, and I would, I would show the public a very, a very grand 1850s house, and then I would go to a more modest house, and then I would go to Murano Island, where they make glass and show how glass is made and the importance of the culture, the history and the identity for that particular city. And then I went to six different cities and it was just really good to be able to do that. Then there was another TV series that I did, which was where we built a, a house from scratch with 14 couples. And these 14 couples wanted to win the house worth half a million pounds. And in order to do that, it was part of a reality TV show. So it was on every day, morning, afternoon,